Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and Independent Photo Imagers. Hello again and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the 150th anniversary episode with Andrew LaFoon, the CEO and co-founder of Mixbook. Oh my gosh, Andrew, we go back how far? Ooh, Gary, I'm pretty sure we met back at the PMA conference. Right. And it was probably around 2008, 2009. Right when we at Mixbook was just coming into the industry, bright eyed, bushy tailed, no idea about the <laughs> photo space. Yeah, I remember I was at the show and you were wandering around looking lost. And I said, I need to, I need to take care of this guy. He looks like he just fell off the uh the puppy uh trail or something, and he needs he needs someone to help him. That's where we started back in the day. So for those who aren't familiar with you and Mixbook, can you talk a little bit about how on earth a kid from Stanford gets a partner and decides to start a, um, a, a photo book company of all things. Yeah. Well, by the way, it's Berkeley, not Stanford. Oh God. we got to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about the junior college across the Bay very much. Jess. Okay. Okay. Go that's, that's fair. Um, that's fair. So funny. I, I always joke with people, you know, my co-founder and I were scrapbooking in our dorm room together. Just <laughs> kidding. Uh, we came into this a bit differently. Mm -hmm. So we had an idea going to Berkeley that we thought you want to democratize all the things. How do I empower everyday ordinary people Mm -hmm. to do new things, to do things better? And the thing we were passionate about was storytelling. We believe every person has a story to tell. And actually the initial market for the idea was yearbooks. Because in yearbooks, you've got 10 kids making a yearbook for 2000 most people's stories really aren't in there. Right. There's, you know, you've got your photo on the page for your grade. Maybe right. if you're on a sports team or in a club, you might have a couple more photos throughout the book. If you're right. on the editing team, you have a lot more photos in the book. <laughs> but most people's stories aren't really there. And right. so that's actually how we started was, hey, let's go after this yearbook space. That mm-hmm. seems like a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. But as we went along, we realized democratizing storytelling is much bigger than school yearbooks. Right. It actually is all storytelling. And there's this whole new market at the time when we started in 2006, still relatively new, five year old market mm-hmm. called photo books. We right. thought that was the future. Yeah, everyone did. Everyone thought it was the future. I mean, think about the era back then. You know, for you kids who are just coming into the industry now, didn't realize, you know, no one knew what was going to be going on in the mid 2000s. Right. Totally. I mean, peep, the expectations were for print were far different. People like uh, Eastman Kodak was thinking, oh, sure, people are going to print all the pictures that they take now. They're going to be printing like you wouldn't believe. And it's like, well, when they can pick the pictures, that's a different dynamic. Yep, I think that's totally true. You know, time warping back to that time. You know, anyone new in the space now has missed a lot of that transformation. I think three things I observed coming to PMA. When I, when I was at PMA, the whole dynamic was how do we get people to print prints again and digital and, oh, it's all about how do we educate people? And my thought was prints are already dead and you just don't realize it yet right. because photo books are going to replace them and they're going to be replaced by all the other products, prints on the wall, canvas prints, acrylic blocks, all these new products. Of course, turns out I was wrong. Prints are far from dead, <laughs> but as a percentage of photos, they've gone down dramatically. What do you right. do with that? Of course, photo books have grown tremendously right from then they've become a huge market and a popular product um the second thing i realized about this market is the companies who are still around in it are crazy resilient right because if you think about the transformation this market's gone through right you went from analog cameras to digital cameras you went from digital cameras to smartphones you went from uh, you know smartphones now we're making the transition to ai every five to ten years the whole market is getting thrown upside down Right. So yeah. this is a market that requires high degree of resilience, high degree of staying in touch with your customers, figuring out who the new customers are, right. and high degree of innovation. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. You can't just sit, right? I mean, that's, you know, like you said, the folks who kind of lived through the analog to digital conversion, which was fraught with uh, casualties all over the place. And then there was the whole desktop to mobile uh, change. Yeah. 
which again, desktop's still around, but obviously mobile and the people could manage that transition well. And then, like you said, now, now, that, now there's the AI space, which we're going to talk about AI later, but because uh, you guys are heavily involved in that. But for the folks, just kind of an overview. I mean, you are known for books, but you do other stuff too. Mm -hmm. So how did that kind of come about as a, as a business decision that, you know, we're the mixed book company and now, but we also make all this other stuff. What was the, was there resistance within the company saying, hey, listen, you know, we're the book company. We're not you know, the, the wall decor company or the gift company? We are, we're a company that focuses a lot on our customers. Right. And candidly, we did, we added new products very early in the life of the company because, mm -hmm. uh, because our customers were asking for it and because we wanted those products, right? We right. looked at the offering out there for card companies. And for us, it's all about storytelling. It's right. all about creativity. And most card companies are, you drop a photo into the template. Right. Most photo book companies are, you drop photos into the template. Right. We're not big on that. Right. We, want, we want to enable people to truly be creative and express themselves. And we said, there's no one out there who does that in cards. Let's do it in cards. Right. There's no one out there who does it in calendars. Let's do it in calendars. Things like home decor, it's less as less so. You know, people aren't spending hours designing their wall art. Usually they're doing that in, in assortment, right? They're designing right. the wall like that. Yeah. So with wall art, less so. But over time, you know, the, our customers want it and they have to go to somebody else if we don't offer it. So that's how we've been in so many product categories. And the truth is, it's still few. Our philosophy is a lot more like Apple. We're not going to do everything. Right. We're going to do products where we believe we have some differentiation, some uniqueness. Right. And we have a reason. If we're just doing the same thing as everybody else, right. we might as well let the other companies do that. That's just right. noise in the market. So it's almost like the 80-20 rule, right? The classic, mm -hmm. you know. You're going to do it. the other 20 stuff, but it's not going to drive the company per se. Yep. We'll do a little. So talk a little bit, because I, I want to kind of stay in the history a little bit. So, you know, you launched in 2008 and, uh, you know, what was the environment there in the startup world when it came to, you know, you're pitching this thing, right? You're looking for yeah. for uh, support and, you know, you you haven't gone public. You haven't done a lot of those kind of things. You bootstrapped a lot of what you're doing. But what were those conversations like? Because yeah. like you said some of your conceptions were not correct. Well, many, most, uh, <laughs> most of our conceptions as twenty-two-year-old Berkeley grads, Berkeley engineering grads. You know, we we launched when we first launched the product in two thousand seven, actually, and we were trying to raise money along the way. Good news about being Berkeley engineering grads is most every VC will take a meeting with you, right? Uh, and pretty much the unanimous response was. Hey, this is great, but all printing is going to be dead in five years and no one's ever going to print anything ever again. Right. So how about you try a different idea? Right. <laughs> you guys seem great. You seem right. really smart. How yeah. about, hmm, yeah. what if you made a YouTube for photo books? Yeah. Or what if you made whatever the thing is, right? Insert your random idea of the, of the minute here. And we just didn't agree with them. Right. We said no in, in a world where there's less and less physical things and in a world that becomes more and more virtual, humans are not becoming virtual. We're physical. So right. we're always going to value physical things. In that future world, you might have less physical things, but the ones you do have should say something about you. Right. So we always believed very, a very contrarian approach. Mm -hmm. The truth is, raising money in 2008, all of EC said no. We pitched over 50 venture capital firms. They all said no. Mm -hmm. And we almost ran out of money. In fact, we were begging. We were basically just begging everyone we knew. I asked all the call, all of my college friends who didn't have much money, like, can I have a thousand dollars? Can I? Have? I was like a, I was like a nonprofit. And, and by the way, we were a nonprofit at that time, <laughs> <laughs> not intentionally, because we had we couldn't get product market fit. When we launched, we thought, oh, we're going to win on price, right. and we're going to launch soft cover books only. And our customers were like, hey, look, no, we actually want hardcover books. These are gifts, people. And, you know, you tripled revenue overnight just with one launch. Right. And, and so it's things like that, listening to your customers, being close to them, understanding them, and staying true to your belief. Like we had some contrarian views. Mm -hmm. Some of them were wrong. Many of them were right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Market actually turned out not to die. It's continued to grow. It's continued right. to change. Right. Yeah. It's, it's definitely not, you know, the entire uh, workflow 
model has completely changed, right? I mean, the way it used to be, right? It was, you know, you take your cam- pictures out of a digital camera, you stick them in your computer, you sort through them, you organize them, you upload them, you, and now it's almost happening instantaneously on your phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a little story since you asked about 2008, we closed our million dollar funding round on July 11th, 2008, which mm-hmm. is the same day IndyMac Bank failed. Okay. So we had an amazing timing not through any fault of our own. We did not expect what was coming. And as you can imagine, the very next, the very first board meeting with those new investors are like, hey, we got to get to profitability. Right. And of course, that's what we did. So we continued our bootstrapping MO, which I actually think is a great approach in this space. Right. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, you and I have both seen, like I said, we've been around, been friends for a long time. We've seen a lot of stuff, as they say. Mm -hmm. And you have people coming in with like wild, you know, checkbook strategies i'm just going to start buying up stuff and they tend to blow through a lot of cash and then struggle because they haven't understood the buying behavior of consumers and i think that's one of the things that entrepreneurs struggle with right i'm going to build a thing i want right i want to do this thing and i'm sure there's other people who want to do it if i spend enough money i'll find them and you kind of had the reverse approach. I mean, yes, you wanted to make books, but you were going to listen to customers as well. Yeah. And of course, we started with making what we wanted. 100% we did. <laughs> and we were the only ones who wanted it. Except for a small handful. And yeah. that small handful actually had great advice for us. Mm-hmm. And that's essentially what we followed to mm-hmm. get to our market fit. So give us an idea as to the scale of mixed book now. You know, you're, you're, you're what, how many years into this? I mean, do, I, I know you can't disclose a lot of information because you're private and that, and that's fine, but just kind of a, a scale of the number of books you may ship at peak or something like that. There's just kind of an idea, the listener's idea of, of how successful you've become. Yep. So 18 years in, mm-hmm. you know, annual number of books printed is going to be in the seven figures, mm-hmm. right? It's the millions. So it's a good scale business. Um, and most of our history, we've been profitable. So mm-hmm. it's been a profitable growth. We've raised, we've raised some money, we raised 11 million in total. Mm-hmm. So not a lot of money actually considering the scale of business. Right, exactly. Which, which has been good for you because you don't have a lot of people picking at you. Right, right. Yeah, and I think the people who have invested in us by and large are really in it because they love what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Right? Right, they love right. the mission. They care about the mission. They love the space. They love the customers. They mm-hmm. love the innovation. They love the technology. That's another weird thing about us. We started, Mixbook started as a technology company. Right. And that's what we are. But as any good technology company needs to do, we became really a customer driven technology company. Right. Well, and let's talk a little bit about the engineering side, because you have done something unusual in the sense that you've set up an engineering uh, arm overseas uh, in, in Europe. You can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so interesting. We it's funny hiring in engineers in the Bay Area is always a challenge, right? And we did. We you can definitely hire amazing talent here, right? This is a place where some of the best talent in the world resides. But my co-founder actually was from a small co- country in Eastern Europe called Moldova, and really, really from Moldova and Romania. And he went back there with an, with an idea of what if. We could benefit the place that I came from, benefit my homeland, so to speak, mm-hmm. and also benefit Mixbook by building a hub there. So yeah, we built a hub in Eastern Europe, and that's been phenomenally successful. And we still retain having a team here. We now have three hubs, actually. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think you that's the, the type of strategy that can scale, mm-hmm. but that hub there has become really the core of our innovation. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, I've talked to people who've done business over there and that it's just, they said, you know, the the intellectual talent, the work ethic and the innovation coming out of there, if you can access it, right? That's been the challenge the last couple of years with, you know, turmoil in that region. But, you know, if you can get to it, it's it's an outstanding pool of talent out there. It is. It is totally true. And I think for me, that kind of goes into culture being the method for success, I think mm-hmm. it's something gets, that doesn't get talked about very much. Entrepreneurial right. podcasts. Everyone's like, what are the three ways to win? What are the five tips? <laughs> ten easy steps to success. We'll get, if, you, if you have anything with the word easy in it, that is a lie. 
Right. Just start out there. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds too good to be true. It probably is. And the thing I underestimated as a technology founder, as a tech, as an engineer, was the importance of of culture and culture meaning how do people work together to accomplish great things? Right. How do you create an environment where people thrive and grow and be at their sure. best? And to me, that's the key ultimately for long-term success. You want to have short-term success. That's all, all you need to do is get to an exit. Well, mm-hmm. fine. Culture is not going to matter that much. Right. Get the right product, get the right marketing, get it out there, grow fast, sell it. Right. Woo, make a deal. Let's make a deal. That is right? an option. It's an op- It's an option and a lot of people do it. And it's kind of the, the adrenaline, let's go, right? Hard driving thing. 80 so, hour weeks and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and you're going to need that in the beginning, no matter what you do. You're yeah. going to need it. Like that, there's no way around that. You're going to, I would say you're going to need that all the time, right? If you want to do ambitious things, you're going to need hard work. That's a right. basic. Right. But the difference to me is if you want to go for a long period of time, if you want to make a transformational impact, it's about the culture. It's about how right. people work together. It's mm-hmm. about having the right people because mm-hmm. innovation is not easy. Right. And you have to be patient. I mean, that's the other part of it is, yep. you know, if you are, do have a culture like you're trying to build, it's you've got to be willing for people to be comfortable making mistakes and mm. learning from them and then doing something better. Yeah. And we've made huge mistakes. We've done a lot of innovative things right. from, you know, we've launched multiple different brands. We've acquired different companies, Mosaic, mm. first m- mobile, first mobile app for making photo books, Montage, the first AI based experience for making photo books. Mm-hmm. We were too early in many cases. Mm-hmm. We came up with these innovative ideas and we thought somebody's going to want them and we launched it didn't work. And then five years later, someone else launched it and it worked. The timing was right. Right. Are those the type of mistakes you think are the biggest mistakes you've learned from that type, the timing mistakes? No, the biggest mistakes are screwing up the culture by far. Hiring the wrong people, not holding people accountable, not building the culture intentionally. That's the biggest. Mm Because at the end of the day, that's the stuff that has the longer term consequences. Those mistakes around Mosaic and Montage were downstream of that. Right. They were downstream of not building the right culture, not being as intentional sure. and chasing, you know, oftentimes, right. It's a temptation. You chase shiny objects. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, of, I mean, look, you and I both know like with the AI thing, right. We were both at visual first with some of their generative AI stuff that was shown two years ago and everyone was floored. They thought this was crazy. And then three months later, it breaks out mainstream and everyone's doing it and it's crazy, but you know, is it a business? Right. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the word is still, I mean, it's, it's an investment. People are doing it. Um, and I think someone will probably figure it out. But right now it's a, it's a gimmick, right? I mean, right. You know, let's talk a little bit about AI because mm-hmm. you are using it. You kind of have applied it to some of your products, but it's in a very, you know, you're not screaming AI at people. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Photo retailers, energize your sales with Share Me Chat, the proven texting platform. Using chat to text on your website keeps your customers connected and buying. See us at Pro and IPI to find out why dealers using Share Me Chat close more sales without adding staff. Find out more at shareme.chat. Yeah, I would say how do you market AI in this space is a challenge Mm -hmm. that I don't know if we really know how to do very well yet. Mm -hmm. But how do you integrate AI into the product to make the experience easier, to unlock new creative possibilities, to Mm -hmm. enable new things that you just couldn't even do before? That's our expertise area. Yeah, And we do, we totally risk being too early there again, but Mm -hmm. we believe the opportunity is so big. Right in the space for this and not only to help current customers, but to find new customers, to enable right. new use cases, new audiences. Right. So that's, you know, we're all in on that. Mm-hmm. So, so talk as, a little bit about like your approach to AI. You're not doing a lot of, you know, uh, goofy avatar creating stuff. I mean, that's all out there and you can certainly plug that in. I'm sure. How are you using AI to improve the customer experience? Yep. So we can kind of go multiple different pieces. I'll just share a couple of our product principles for you. Mm -hmm. A core product principle for us is authenticity. Mm -hmm. We're about creating and talking about what's real, what's Mm -hmm. true, what really happened. Our customers can totally make up stories if they want to. 
Mm -hmm. but we're not trying to create tools that are about, let me make up a, you know, a photo book about the time Gary and Tom Cruise went on a vacation together. And that's fake. Well, right? no one's supposed to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, sorry for disclosing your uh, top secret project. The, so for us, it's actually not about the gimmicky piece. It's about how do we take AI and enhance human creativity right. in a way that enables people to tell their stories. Right. For us, we're a storytelling company at our right. roots. That's our core. Right. So how does AI help that? Well, in fact, much of the AI that exists, much of the generative AI exists, that exists doesn't necessarily directly help that today. Right. So that's, that's where we're on the emerging frontier of building tech that Right. You know, it might be a year away. It might be five years away. Some of this right. stuff is really hard and you just, there's no way to predict, right? Until you R&D it, you don't know how long it's going to take. Right. And when the customers will accept it, right? I mean, that's the other piece of it, right? Is you've got to be in the right place where customers are saying, yeah, I want to try and do that. I will allow mixed book to look at all my pictures and suggest a book. Yep. Right? That's a bit of trust that I'm not sure I want X photo book company to do that. Right. Right. And I, I think you're totally right. And it, that's, I think that's one of the things about building on principles, building from a, a principles perspective. That's how, if you don't, the AI, the big risk with AI is you can lose your brand trust. Right. And not to mention, of course, you can do a lot of damage in the world. Right. AI goes wrong. So for us, we believe AI is a good thing. AI is a tool mm -hmm. if it's put in the hands of humans. Mm -hmm. to enhance their creativity, to enable new possibilities. So that's what we're doing. Really, we've been, candidly, we've been doing it since the beginning. The first right. version of Mixbook that launched, the core idea was actually algorithmic creation. Right. Now, at the time, all people wanted was more creativity. And it turns out that's true. Up mm -hmm. until now, there's really not been a way to merge that high degree of creativity and creative possibility mm -hmm. with AI. It's really mm -hmm. been one or the other. You can mm -hmm. go spend 10 hours and make the book you want, or... You can do it in one automated tap and get a book you don't exactly want, but it's good enough, right? If it gets you 85% there, you're probably fine with it. And that's one of the things I think stalled the early photo book market was mm -hmm. people instinctively knows no stories, right? People That's how people communicate. They tell stories, but they don't necessarily know how to build a story in a book, right? You know, right. beginning, middle, end you know, transitions yeah. between things and all these things. And that's where AI can actually help is some of totally those agree. assistive um, applications. Yep, totally agree. Uh, we've seen, you know, we've been productizing real AI from a, from a sense of computer vision and machine learning and neural nets for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that for that technology, much of it is very mature in the space at this point. Right. Computer vision is very mature at this right. point. Gen AI is totally bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. so that's you know that's where we're, we're kind of operating right at that bleeding edge right now now do you ever do things with ai or with some of these tools to enhance someone's uh product with like without them knowing it or choosing it i mean do you say hey listen you know we're going to adjust the the composition of this picture we're going to crop it maybe we'll clean up the um the the face a little bit you know lighten. i mean how how, how much do you know is okay Right now, it's it's almost all opt-in. Yeah, okay. Because the now it's pretty, a lot of customers are using it. Mm -hmm, sure. But, you know, there, there's a group of customers who's like, I want to do everything myself. I'm in full manual mode. Right. For those people, they're in full manual mode. They didn't opt into any other features. They didn't opt into AI it's design. Too much time on their hands. It's a, it's a hobby, right? Yeah. A lot yeah. of people, it's a hobby. So that's a different... A very different feeling than I just need to get this thing done for my wife's birthday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Your Christmas is coming and it's the shipping cutoff is this date or whatever. Yeah, it's a little. You got it. So looking forward, um, you know, there's a lot of speculation within the industry. We were talking a little bit about that before the recording about kind of like, where are some of the future opportunities uh, for the industry as a whole, not just mixed book? You know, you've been around and you've probably one of the most well-connected folks in the industry, uh, thanks to your involvement in the Dead Pixel Society, of course. Where do you kind of see the industry going, you know, kind of from your uh, uh, position as as one of the longstanding warrior companies in the industry? You know, you've been through a lot. Yep. So a few things. The good news is emerging generations seem to love printing. Mm -hmm. The good news is the younger generation loves is actually more creative. 
Right. The good news is in a world where AI is automating a lot of the boring, repetitive tasks, the sure. world is drawn more to creativity and storytelling and what makes us unique and personalization. Sure. All those megatrends yeah. point to a great situation for our industry. Right. But I do feel that we're on the precipice of a situation where there's going to be a major adaptation needed. Right. And many companies are not going to make it yeah. for that reason. It's the same thing that's happened before. It's the same right. thing that happened as we got to smartphones. It's the same thing that happened when we went digital. And I, it's, it's hard to know what's on the other side of the precipice, what right. new products will come out of it, what new experiences will come out of it. But the market opportunity is still so big. Right. Because there's nothing that speaks more to who we are than our photos and our memories. Mm -hmm. Sure. There's nothing that's going to create a better gift. There's nothing that's going to be a better thing to pass down to future generations. There's nothing that's going to be a better way of expressing ourselves. There's nothing that's going to give you more of that reminiscent, put you in that kind of place where you're reliving the things that matter most, all these pieces, right? Nothing is going to be deeper than that. So I'm really bullish on this space. I feel like we're stuck in this weird niche. Right. And AI if nothing should unlock a brighter future right. where our space is actually able to reach a, a much broader audience than we haven't been able to reach in the past. That's our belief. That's where we're going. That's what we're going after. Well, we are going to be super excited to watch you and continue to cover Mixbook and your adventures uh, as we go on. Andrew, if people want to reach out to you, how could they uh, get in contact with you just to uh, maybe partner or <laughs> learn more about what you guys do? Andrew at mixbook.com. Very easy. Well, that's all. Awesome. Well, Andrew, it's great to connect. I'm sure we'll be seeing you soon in the next few weeks at industry events. Thank you for being my 150th guest on the show and a longtime supporter. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Gary. The pixels might be dead, but the society is alive and well. <laughs> Go dead pixel society. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.